Hello fellow cyborgs, today I am going to be doing my autumn reading wrap-up, which will include wrap-ups of the months of October and November, because September had its own wrap-up, and so did Victober, all of the classics I read in October. So let's get started with a children's picture book. This is A Tower of Giraffes, Animals in Groups by Anna Wright. This isn't a narrative so much as it is um, just some fun facts about different animals, in fact about animal groups. So each page looks like this. It has illustrations, mixed media illustrations of the animals in question. So these elephants have wallpapers on their body and cloth in on their ears. And then it tells you what a group of elephants is called, which in this case it's a herd. And then it gives you a little bit of fun facts about the animal itself. My favorite page is a flock of sheep because these sheep have patches of knitted fabric for their fleece, which I think is just really funny. So this is just a lovely, really beautiful, simple, picture book that I just couldn't leave the store. I was in a children's bookstore with my friend and I just couldn't leave without this. So yes, I had to share that with you. Then I read A Fine and Private Place by Peter S. Beagle. This was a buddy read with one of my subscribers. Hi! I originally started out loving this. The first couple chapters, the characterization of the characters was just spot on, but slowly there became less and less of a plot and I wasn't all that satisfied with the end. I thought that half of the characters got abandoned there was no wrap-up for them, which I was kind of perturbed about. The other thing is that this takes place in the summertime in a New York cemetery, New York City cemetery, but I couldn't help picturing this being taking place in fall and the fact that I was reading it in fall didn't help. So it was just kind of odd to have a story about a cemetery set in the summer. It just felt very strange. Not that cemeteries are only appropriate in the cold times of year, but in any case, I enjoyed this, but I wasn't super wowed and I'm not sure if I'm going to be seeking out anything more by Peter S. Beagle. Then I buddy read The King of the Cats and Other Feline Fairy Tales, which is edited by John Richard Stevens, and this was another buddy read with another subscriber. Hello! I overall enjoyed this collection. I believe I gave it three out of five stars. With fairy tales, I often find that I don't actually enjoy the writing style or even the morals of the stories, because some of them just aren't my cup of tea, but I found that most of these stories were really well edited, and I also loved how at the beginning of each story you got a bit of a description as to its origin or why this sort of tale, if not specific tale, is incredibly historically important as far as cat fairy tales. Some of my favorite stories were from Norway, Iceland, Germany, Sweden, Scandinavia, and then there was one in the United States that I really enjoyed. So overall this is one of the better fairy tale collections I've ever read, but it was still, you know, just like it was good but it wasn't life-changing. Then I picked up an Eva Ibbotson read, The Great Ghost Rescue, just in time for Halloween, and this I buddy read with Emily Kate, who has a lovely channel. Eva Ibbotson is my favorite children's author, and I have yet to be disappointed by Eva Ibbotson. This story happens to be about a family of ghosts whose castle is being turned into a tourist resort, and they have to go try to find another castle, another gloomy place to live, and they end up getting the help from a boy who is alive and he eventually has to travel to Parliament to try to get them to understand that there are ghosts in need. This also talks a little bit about vegetarianism, about being ecologically minded. I really love how Ibbots Ibbotson's characters never fall under classic sort of assumptions between physicality and personality. My big beef with Matilda by Roald Dahl was the fact that all of the mean people were also ugly and fat and all of the good people were thin and small. In this we have these ugly, terrifying ghosts who are the most wonderful characters in the story. There's even a point where the main boy character has to question himself for having judged someone based on appearance alone. So very many good messages in here. The messages got a little confused at times, but overall super enjoyable and a really lovely Halloween read. Then I want to talk to you about two ebooks which I read whilst I was traveling because I just brought my Kindle because I knew I was going to be acquiring more books. The first one is the Dream Quest of Velvet Bow by Kaiz Johnson, and this is her most re recent published work, and this is a novella. I really, really enjoyed this, and now I have read all of Kaiz Johnson's published works, apart from perhaps some short stories that I had have to read magazines to get to. Velvet Bow is about Velvet Bow, who is a professor at a woman's college attached to like this main university in a Cthulhu-like realm. This world borrows heavily from the traditions that H.P. Lovecraft had in the sorts of worlds that he was building 
something really strange. Like the sky never stays the same color. It's always roiling and boiling and that there are these really creepy creatures. The story begins with a prominent student running away with a young man, a dreamwalker who's from our world who has infiltrated this other world that the story takes place in. And Velvet Bow has to go try to get them back because it would be a huge scandal and it would discredit the woman's college if the student was allowed to be taken away. Right at the beginning of her journey, Velvet Bow is joined by a cat companion who doesn't say anything to her. She doesn't know it, but it just keeps tagging along. Velvet Bow has to brave many a weird and strange sort of place, eventually a goblin underrealm. It was just a really, really atmospheric read, obviously well, well told as Kaiju Johnson can do no wrong in my eyes. This was just a really lovely reading experience and it was the first thing I finished after a hiatus of reading because of traveling and it was a lovely way to get back into reading indeed. Then I read Outlaw by Kay Eason, which is the follow-up to Enemy, which I read earlier in the year. Enemy, I really, really enjoyed and I gave it four out of five stars. It was wintry, it had to do with people of color and having a woman protagonist in a high fantasy sort of scenario. It had ghosts, it was awesome. Outlaw, unfortunately, did not live up to my expectations. I think it a little bit fell into second book syndrome, if only in its pacing. The second book was at a breakneck pace almost the entire way and things got far more complicated and far more actiony and I really loved the quiet moments that I found in Enemy. So Outlaw was not the same as Enemy, even in tone, and that's why I really missed that. So Outlaw got three out of five stars as compared to Enemy's four out of five. And I certainly won't be chomping at the bit to continue with the series, but I haven't completely given up on it. Then I buddy read Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates with Sabrina from Unmanaged Mischief. This is amazing. I gave it five out of five stars and I will shortly be posting a full review on it. So look out for that to hear more about my thoughts on Revolutionary Road, but in essence, please read it. I also did another buddy read. This was from Hillary from Your Robot Friend. This is Another Country by James Baldwin. I am also going to be doing a full in-depth review video on this. I gave it four out of five stars and my overall takeaway is that I absolutely adore James Baldwin's writing style. In November, I also buddy read with Meryl from A Blackbird's Books. This is Aberat by Clive Barker. This is a reread. This was one of my favorite books through my adolescence. Unfortunately, this reread wasn't nearly as wonderful as I remember it being, and I think that's okay. This book is still exactly the same as it was when I was 14 and 15. I think I just am looking for more out of the books that I'm reading now than what Aberat can provide. The things that I was looking for most heavily in my reading when I was 14 and 15, like a cute love story and wonderful world building and characters I could connect to aren't necessarily the same things that I'm looking in my reading now, which would more be psychological depth, wonderful writing style. 15-year-old Amanda and 26-year-old Amanda just need different things from books. I also think that having read the third book where a lot of these mysteries in, that are set up in the first book are revealed, the mystery just wasn't there upon this reread. So I have unfortunately demoted Aberat from my favorite shelf and I have given this now three out of five stars instead of five out of five. However, I still have even fonder memories of the sequel to Abrat, which is Days of Magic, Knights of War. So I hope to reread that sometime in the future. And also the dreaded third book, which <laughs> we'll see. I still highly recommend that if you can get your hands on Abrat, that you do. But know that this first volume is really concerned with building the world, which is a fabulous world indeed, rather than having a plot or perhaps the most well-rounded characters. But I still think it is very quality young adult literature with a horror bend to it. And finally, da 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 I finished Herman Melville's Moby Dick. I started reading this in February, I believe, and so I finished it right at the end of November. Overall, I gave this two out of five stars. I absolutely adored the first about 150 pages when Ishmael, 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 when Ishmael is a real character and he hangs out with Queequeg and he listens to an awesome preacher who tells him about Jonas and the whale before they go to sea. It was amazing. It was better than I could have expected Moby Dick to be. But once they hit the waves, Ishmael 
Ishmael becomes this omniscient narrator with no personality who somehow can see everything that's happening on the ship. And his biggest concern is educating you on whaling and whale anatomy, which I wasn't that interested in. I wanted to see more of the bromance between Ishmael and Queequeg. After I finished this, I read the introduction and the afterword, which are in my edition. The afterword is by Christopher Buckley, and he seemed to be really concerned with engaging with a young adult audience who was being forced to read this for a class. He had a ton of pop culture references in his afterword, and at one point, he talks about how there is a lot of boring parts in here, like the whale anatomy that I mentioned before. And in essence, his, his explanation for this is that, well, a lot of epic, wonderful works have boring parts. Like, look at Ulysses, look at, you know, and it's just like, I just because all the other kids are doing it doesn't mean that's what you should be doing. So I don't still understand what Melville was trying to do with those non y sort of bits. And I could do more research on this, but I'm just kind of done at the moment. I will perhaps reread this in the future. I'm not going to get rid of my copy because Queequeg and Ishmael are perhaps, if I ever have to answer the OTP question, would be my OTP. But yeah, I was definitely less than thrilled once they got to see, which is like the whole point of this book. So Moby Dick. At the very end of November, I also finally finished The Master by Colm Toybean. I believe I started this in August and it just got set aside. This I really enjoyed. I gave it four out of five stars, but I must say that this is such a quiet novel that it tiptoes on boring at certain parts. I found that I had a really hard time focusing on this because it was such a quiet, gentle sort of story. That's exactly what it was supposed to be, and it did it brilliantly, but it still wasn't terribly engaging. That being said, if you read the first chapter and you are just completely into it, that's the rest of this book. So this is a fictionalized, I guess, biography of Henry James, the writer. In here, you get to learn about Henry James' past as well as his present, which is very solitary, and also about the origin stories, I'm assuming fictionalized, of some of his famous works like Turn of the Screw. I had a hard time figuring out just how fictiony this actually was and how much it was actually fact from Henry James' life. I have no clue, but in any case, if you're interested in themes of loneliness, solitude, introversion, repressed homosexuality, then I think you would enjoy this. And also, you, you need to be a fan of a slow, quiet story because that's what this is all about. And finally, I also finished Kindred by Octavia Butler, and I managed to get the library sticker off it thanks to Sarai from Sarai Talks Books, so I will link her video on how to get stickers off of books down below because it was awesome. In any case, I'm going to be giving this a full review as well because I have a lot to say. I gave this four out of five stars and in a nutshell, before the review, all you need to know is that this book made me so angry. So those are all the books I want to talk about today. There were some books that I didn't talk about today that already have reviews, so check out my channel for some reviews you may have missed. Also, be on the lookout for those upcoming reviews because I'm very excited to make them for you and hopefully we can learn things, me about what I really feel about these books, and you, I guess, kind of the same thing. But in any case, I hope that you have a lovely day. Thank, thank you for watching and continue to be lovely. You're a tower of drafts. And thank you to my patrons who financially support my channel through Patreon. I hope that you are having a glorious December of it so far that you've experienced and that you had a lovely autumn as far as reading goes at the very least.